Hi everyone, I'm Scott Brandley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite growth, and inspire others. On today's episode, we're going to hear how one woman's heartbreaking experiences as a childhood sexual abuse survivor led her to a life of helping others to heal. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another great edition of Latter-day Lights. Um, Today, we're honored to have an incredible guest with us today, Lisa Plum. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today and being willing to share your story. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be with you guys. I've been binge watching your podcast, so I'm excited. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I hope that you've been enjoying them. (laughs) Yes. Oh, great. So for our listeners, Lisa is actually another client of the amazing book editor, Kim Clements, the same book editor that um, Scott and I have been using for a while now. We had her on as a guest as well. And um, uh, Kim told me a little while ago about the memoir that that Lisa is writing. And Kim said, you have to have her on your show. Do you want me to reach out and see if she'd be willing? And I was like, yes, heck yeah, because it just... I mean, your story is, it, it's just, it just, what I've heard of it is, um, is life changing. It really, really is. So I know it's, it's probably not the easiest thing to share all the time, but I love that you have taken it, that you're putting it into a memoir, that you're, you're using it for good. I just think, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about this episode and, and, um, the, the lives that can be touched through through you sharing your story. So seriously, thank you for, for being on here today. No, thank you. I, um, first off, I, I really don't share my story that much. However, I am writing a memoir, (laughs) so, um, it's all good. Uh, there's a purpose and a reason for it. And, um, as appropriate, I definitely want to share with people and, you know, if people can, learn from my experience as I learn from theirs, then all the better. Number one, most important for me, though, is to um, encourage and empower fellow survivors. Well, Lisa, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and and what you do for a living? Okay, well, currently, I am a marriage family therapist licensed in California and Arizona. (laughs) I have been married 35 years, just celebrated my 35th anniversary with my husband by going to Disneyland for five days back to back. (laughs) Don't do that. Yeah. And you're still married? Wow. I mean, it it was fun, but take a day off in between. Okay. (laughs) Um, I have three sons that are amazing, of course. Um, They're all adults now. And um, well, I could go on about that. And I have an amazing daughter-in-law. One of them is me. Aww. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. Very cool. And um, yes, I am Kim Clement's client. She's graciously, kindly guiding me and helping me with this memoir, which I've been attempting to write for 30 years, I guess, 25 years, um, something like wow. that. <laughs> um, but on my own, it didn't work out very well. However, under her guidance, she encouraged me to submit part of my memoir to LDS PMA's emerging author um, category for memoir. And I won last year. So I'm an award-winning author. Aw. Wow. Congrats. That's awesome. That's amazing. <laughs> Scott and I actually both entered for this year. So I don't know if they have different categories or if we're competing against each other, but. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see who wins, Alicia. I know. <laughs> Um, I do work with um, fellow survivors of sexual abuse and other abuse, trauma, stress. I I love to work with couples. And um, I'm very blessed to be where I am right now. And I wouldn't be here without very patient guidance of the spirit for the past 36 years. I think that's a great segue into you sharing your story with us. So why don't you take it from there, Lisa? Okay, well... I was born in 1968. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to have fun with it. I, it it's a serious topic. Yeah, you have to have some fun. One of the fun. messages 
yeah i mean is that you can still have a good life okay that's the point mm -hmm. and yes i was born in 1968 and i was mm -hmm. born in riverside california born and raised never thought i'd leave but then i needed to anyway um that's southern california and um my home life was a hot mess okay um it wasn't just sexual abuse however there's multiple sexual abuse perpetrators in my home um there was family abuse uh, you know you can imagine right so all of it and um as part of the way uh i guess my family structure was the way that the times were the neighborhood um i started using substances very early on I was a regular smoker of cigarettes by eight years old. Uh, I did smoke before wow. that, but I know by eight I was regularly smoking. And then, of course, we'd sneak, you know, alcohol out of the liquor cabinet. My parents divorced when I was five. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they did everything you shouldn't do when you divorce, triangulate the children and, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And my mom started to have singles parties and that, you know, a mother... When I say this, I'm not saying it's a hundred percent. Okay. But how I often say it is a single mother with children can be, can be a magnet for pedophiles. With yeah. that said, my best yeah. parent is my stepfather. Okay. So yeah. he, he's my best parent. All right. My protective factor. But, um, anyway, that's, that's one um, way that pedophiles came into our life. And so then Throughout my childhood, I was abused multiple times and from kindergarten on, like I had 30 absences on, 35 absences on my kindergarten report card. Um, <clears throat> I did okay in elementary school. Um, I got all A's <laughs> when I went, but wow. once I hit junior high, it was fail, fail, fail. Um, and, you know, turns out pedophiles don't care if you do well in school or not. And... Um, I was able to graduate high school because they had mercy on me. I went to high school, then I went to continuation high school. That didn't work out. And then I ended up doing an independent study program that they basically handed me my diploma. But wow. um, in that whole process, I was involved as a victim witness in um, three court cases in my childhood. Uh, the system did not rescue me. They did. A little bit. I was put into a shelter home. I have a detective who I am Facebook friends with now and have talked to throughout the years that did take me in under his wing a little bit. Um, so I was in a shelter home and a foster home for a little while, but then CPS put me right back in, never got therapy. Well, that's not 100% true. In junior high, uh, my mother did get in trouble for my attendance, so they sent me to counseling and um, the therapist asked me some questions and I shared a recent event that caused her to call CPS. And then I was busted. Of course, I felt terrible about oh. it. But a couple things about that. One, if she had asked more questions, she would have got a lot more information. And two, mm -hmm. even though at the time it was very painful for me as an adult, I, it's been a validating experience. And I understand why she did that. Um, but yes. then as a teenager, I had not the best situation. However, through that situation is where I found the gospel through the family of this person that I was involved with. And, um, first I started playing sports, which I love sports and then was invited to take missionary lessons. And I was like, well, I don't mind learning what you believe, but don't expect me baptized okay and um <laughs> i always had a faith in god i was born episcopalian and i remember praying obsessively as a child looking back now i realized i kind of had some ocd trauma going on there but i definitely had faith in prayer oh. i just didn't know what i was per se my stepdad came in my life from the age of nine to twelve and he was buddhist and wow. um, had some really okay. good experiences with that. Anyway, so when I found the gospel, I took missionary lessons for a year or so, a little bit over a year. And through that process, I got clean and sober because I was a regular user of, of course, cigarettes, methamphetamines, marijuana, oh. alcohol, um, wow. other drugs sometimes. But um, 
And how old were you? Well, when I joined the church, I was 18. But I started missionary lessons at 16. I think I was an old, okay. older 16. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, I really, I, what I thought Mormons were, <laughs> um, were polygamists that couldn't wear makeup or dance. <laughs> That's all I oh, know. Man. And I'm like, why would I want to be part of that? <laughs> <laughs> not that I was wearing makeup. I was too ashamed and didn't want to draw attention to myself to wear makeup. Mm. Okay. And I wasn't dancing either because the same reason. But anyway, that's what I'd heard about Mormons. And then when I started taking missionary gotcha. lessons, I was like, oh, <laughs> there's people just don't know. People just don't right. know. Yeah. And I yeah. don't remember my last drink or my last line or um, whatever, but um, I just stopped using substances all the way up to cigarettes. Okay. Then I couldn't quit. It's like I had been smoking from in the womb. You know, my mother was a heavy smoker and um, I had a blessing to quit smoking. That was my own personal miracle. So, Question, when you, okay, so you're 16, at that point, had the sexual abuse stopped when you joined the church? Well, what happened was I was with a person that was significantly older and it was a very bad relationship. Mm -hmm. There was, it was, you know, inappropriate in multiple ways. Okay, and they um, did not have my best interest. So, um I was able to break up with them and stop. Like when I learned about the law of chastity, I was like, because this person was supposed to be aware of that. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just wasn't raised that way. (laughs) Um, So I just stopped. I, I I was empowered by the spirit. I wasn't before. And then mm-hmm. I was single. And right. so I was still living in my home, which was a volatile environment and not supportive. My mother bought um, a lot of anti-Mormon books and propaganda. And mm. My family mocked me, but um, that's pretty much when the sexual abuse stopped. So, Lisa, um, I have a question kind of going back to when the counselor first discovered that there was a problem. Um, I know when I was a bishop, I had to, when somebody came to me with a problem, I had to kind of go down that road and it was uncomfortable for me to do that. And I think kind of that's human nature, even for a counselor to maybe not want to open that box, that Pandora's box. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Would have, would that have changed things in your life if she would have had the courage to to op- open that box and, and find out more of what was going on? Well, it's hard to know if it would have changed my life because what ended up happening, I didn't get rescued anyway, which I'll, I'll tell you about. I mean, in a way. Um, but uh, let me just say that as the counselor i i get that but you know it is our obligation to protect children and i just want to encourage counselors to take your time and ask more questions okay but um yeah if she had asked more questions like are other people touching you or you know um wow i I wouldn't have known what to say I, i i mean at this point i'm i probably about um 11, maybe, I mean, I'm mm-hmm. junior high. Anyway, I um, I didn't know what to think. Okay, I'm, I'm completely emotionally flooded and overwhelmed. But um, if she had asked more questions, she might have found out that uh, my mother and her boyfriend previous had taken us to nudist camps and involved us in sexual activities. She might have found out that I was currently going to a nudist camp with this um, pedophile couple that um, were very involved in my life, that I was told I had to go with them to their home 
uh, in Orange County, and they had access to be days on end and hours upon hours. And as a little girl, and just everything that was going on, yeah, I didn't like it, but it wasn't super unfamiliar to me. And so one day, the man said, hey, Lisa, I'm going to take you and some other girls to a photographer to see if you, you know, because you could be a model. And I was like, no way. You know, I just thought I was fat, yeah. ugly. But I look back at my pictures and I thought it was this little girl. But anyway, <laughs> you know, low self-esteem, all of that took me to a photographer. So um, I didn't want to go. I, I didn't, and you know, I wasn't excited about that prospect, but it didn't matter what I wanted. So he took myself and some girls to this photographer's studio. And at the time, I'm a kid. I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I'm lost, mm -hmm. basically. I'm at the mercy of whoever is driving me around. And so I didn't think anything of it. But, but I heard a voice tell me, memorize how to get there. And I mean, mm -hmm. it's just kind of a... A strong impression voice okay and um i kind of ignored it and i felt it again memorize how to get to the photographers so i did and i i just i looked out the window i was in the back of a pickup truck with a shell and i was like 7th street 7th street 14th street 14th street i can still see the office building that the studio was in and i went um we got there and I didn't think anything of it. Okay. So then we go up there and the guy is really, um, cold. You could feel he had a very dark spirit and, um, it was just headshots, no, no, nothing, um, nude or anything. And then we went back and the other girls went home and it was me and these two people. And I overheard him on the phone with the photographer and he said, yeah, yeah, Lisa and so-and-so will do nude pictures. And I was like, what? No, even though we were going to nudist camps and this was part of the lifestyle and there was always a camera out, I never really thought about it. But when he said it in that way, I was like, no, I won't. But mm -hmm. again, of course, my opinion didn't really matter. However, that day they took me home. And then I started the school week. During that week, detectives came to my school because they got busted. And so that never happened with that photographer. Um, but it turns out that one of the detectives asked me if I knew where the photographer lived or his studio was because this couple didn't know. And um, I said, yeah, you know, I memorized how to get there. But before I, I said I memorized how to get there, the detective probably shouldn't have done this, but started to tell me that this photographer was wanted for murdering children. Oh. And so um, wow. I said, well, yeah, of course, you know, I will take you. And he said, let's go right now. So it's me and a couple of detectives, wow. and I just take them down this street, that street, you know, a miracle that I knew how to get there. But the voice told me how to, you know, memorize how to get there. And so we go up to the studio door, knock, knock, knock. And I'm, I feel like this is what I need to do, right? But I'm wondering if I'm going to get murdered in the process, right? Uh, yeah. I'm wow. going to get and hurt somehow. But the, um, the door never opened. They didn't bash it in or anything. I don't really know what happened, but um, wow. I know something must have come of it because that voice was the spirit. I know that. Definitely. Wow. So not only were you dealing with this awful, oh my gosh, awful situation of just with your, in your family life and your your mom bringing you to these different, you know, nudist camps and letting you go with these complete strangers who were very much not good people. Now you're having to deal with all of this extra trauma of what if this guy gets out? What if he knows it's me? Right. And then, and, and you're still staying quiet pretty much about this 
about everything, right? And all the way up to the point where you get baptized. So after you got baptized, um, did you start opening up at all at that point with other people or how did you start working towards your healing after baptism? Yeah. Well, let me just say that when I was pondering, you know, and praying, if I should join the church, you know, what does it mean to be a Christian? What am I supposed to think about these scriptures and all of this? And, um, I really got the strong impression that I am loved by Heavenly Father, Mm -hmm. by our Heavenly Parents. I'm absolutely loved. And there's like a fork in the road. And if I stayed on this path, which is drugs, sexual abuse, um, I'm going to die probably early, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, it won't be pleasant. But but Heavenly Father's love for me won't be any less. But if I take this path, where much is given, much is required. <laughs> um, it'll be good. It'll be great. But it won't always be easy. And at the time, I'm like, well, psh, I don't want this. I mean, I felt so um, validated listening to the missionaries and all that. It's like, well, I never wanted any of this in the first place. And mm-hmm. I'm right. But I was always told through my life, you're being dramatic. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you shouldn't feel the way you feel, basically. So mm-hmm. I um, I was like, yes, Heavenly Father, I want out. Okay. And so I got baptized. You know, I have friends in the singles ward. And I was going to the singles ward under 18. <laughs> but everyone was super sweet and nice to me. And that's where I met my husband. <laughs> and um, I had a reprieve of a year. I just felt like kind of like a normal 18 year old, I guess. Mm. I don't know what that really feels like, but <laughs> I think it might be what a normal 18 year old might feel like. Okay. And mm-hmm. I just did my martial arts training and I went to work and I went to church and church activities and it was great. Okay. And awesome. in the, in the course of this time, um, my husband, he had been a, a good friend for a while. Like we talked gospel topics because the other person I was with didn't have that ability mm-hmm. and, um, got engaged, got married in the LA temple. And then I was just like, so I'm 19 when I got married, very young, but you know, <laughs> it was good. And then um, a year later, our oldest son came into the world, which was shocking. I thought I would do labor much better, but <laughs> anyway, it was quite the ordeal. I think we all think such that. Such a blessing. <laughs> Like, okay. Um, But (laughs) bam, postpartum depression hit hard. Oh, man. And I started having flashbacks. And by the way, that's not unusual for a child to start to trigger the trauma. Right. Nothing that they did per se, right? Mm -hmm. But that's when I started to get all these feelings. I started to get cravings. Um, I, I, I felt overwhelming emotions and so what happens is people have to suppress those you know growing up your experiences unless you mm-hmm. have a supportive environment where you can process your feelings which i didn't and now i'm in this safe environment and having triggers and stuff and they are just coming out i didn't really fully understand what was going on mm-hmm. but kind of like right. dual awareness and so then that's when I started to go to therapy with a bishop's, you know, guidance, insight. Um, I I was like, you know, it's fine. I, I don't have any pride. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm nothing. I just want to do the right thing. I don't want my baby to suffer. What did I do? I brought him and now I'm his mom. Oh, no, poor thing. I felt, you know, and I, I did consider that maybe I shouldn't be living. Wow. The feelings wow. were overwhelmed, but that's when I started to go through. Wow. You know, um, we spoke briefly uh, about how um, I experienced some childhood sexual abuse as well when I was younger and my parents didn't know anything about it. Um, they had no idea what was going on. And, and I stayed quiet for a really, really long time until 
uh, my best friend's mom asked the uncomfortable, the uncomfortable question. You know, she came right out and she just asked us point blank, my my best friend and I, if things had happened with this person. And um, and I remember like l- like letting that out and telling people I thought, oh, I'm good to go. And it wasn't until years later when I was married. And like you said, I had my first baby that I turned into a helicopter mom. And I would have the the craziest, most vivid like dreams and thoughts pop into my head of all of these horrible accidents happening happening to my firstborn kid. Um, and it didn't stop until I went through and had all three of them. I had all three of my kids. And I remember being so triggered by the tiniest things, you know, like things like I would I would get up in the middle of the night four and five and six times and I would go check every door and every window and make sure everything was locked, even though I knew it was locked. And I would check to make sure that my kids were all in their own beds and that they're, you know, I would look in their closets and I would look under their beds. And it was just this like incessant, like I kept feeling like my kids were going to be in, like they were in danger, you know? Um, and I, I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm driving myself insane. I'm driving myself insane. And it was kind of bleeding out into my marriage and into my parenting and, um, and I just kept worrying all the time about what was going to happen. So I didn't really want my kids going to babysitters. You know, I didn't really want them to even go more than 10 feet away from me, like on a playground or something, because I kept thinking, I can't protect them. I can't protect them. I can't protect them. And that was horrible. It wasn't until um, years later, I got involved with a company that their whole mission is helping women who were sexually abused as children to be able to heal. And so they set up a whole foundation um, called, well, the name of it has changed. So now the new name is Sapria, S-A-P-R-E-A. And they have these retreats, these free retreats that women can go to and they get to learn about healing. And, um, and I remember just being so um, like you said, so validated in that process of being like, Hey, I'm not a crazy person. Like everything that's happening is because of what happened. Like it's not my decision to act this way or to feel this way. It's it's what's happening. And now that I understand what's going on in my brain, now I can start working towards healing. So um, it, it's – I don't know – I truly don't know a single person who's ever experienced deep trauma, whatever it is, who has been able to heal completely on their own. I think that you absolutely need both the gospel – and you need professional counseling, some type of professional help. And I love that in this past general conference, um, who was it that brought it up? Scott, you might know. Uh, someone just brought it up in this past general conference. They talked oh, about. I can see his face. I'm blanking. I know. <laughs> I'm going to look it up. We'll we'll try to link the talk. But it was great because he talked about the need to go and, you know, like like that's why Heavenly Father gave us professionals in this life is so that we can utilize them. You're right. Like it's okay to go to therapy. It's okay. If you need some types of medication or something like heavenly father has granted those to us for our healing, for our progress, for us to be able to um, become stronger and, and to overcome those weaknesses. Right. Yes. When I was a young mother, oh my gosh, if you wanted to hold my baby, if I, if daggers could shoot out of my eyes, it would have been stabbed to death. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. why would you want to hold my baby? Yeah. Yeah. So how did you, how did you get from that point to becoming a counselor? Like, what was that transition? Well, um, <clears throat> I started going to therapy, had various different experiences, and, um, but started, um, participating in some sexual abuse recovery groups. And I decided that, gosh, I think I want to be a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, started to try to take some classes. Now my anxiety was so bad though, that my first two classes I had to drop. I couldn't complete them. And one, okay. I did not drop correctly. So I have an F on my record. <laughs> um dang it but i just you know through prayer and studying and in my patriarchal blessing and like i just felt like even though i mean you know, i was suffering a lot but there was good mixed in too 
Mm -hmm. um, that if I just keep trying, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. I know. So finally, I took a class in my brainstem. I was able to accomplish it. And that built my confidence. And, and, and the whole time I'm doing this as well, um, I am training in martial arts. So martial arts nice. is a really great thing. Yoga is a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, sort of one of the number one treatments for trauma. I yeah. didn't know that at the time, but yeah. um, mm -hmm. Judith Herman is a famous trauma expert and wrote Trauma and Recovery. And I read that book and she said, um, if you're a sexual abuse survivor, you should take martial arts. And I was like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm sure mm -hmm. that helped me in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the trauma is one of the reasons is the trauma response. Um, you can, um, you know, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Yep. In mm -hmm. martial arts, you can be in charge in a sense. Right. Take, take back your power, but also just mm -hmm. the endorphins and everything. But right. anyway, so I started taking classes. I've had, um, at least 11 therapists I was counting. Wow. Maybe a couple more. I don't remember. I'm still in therapy with um, my current therapist, Dr. Everett Bailey, um, doing EMDR. Maybe I'm jumping wow. ahead. Yeah. So I've been as a client doing it for a few years. And as a therapist, I am trained in EMDR. So that's pretty awesome. But nice. over the years, I um, took classes until I finally graduated with my master's degree of 41. That's a cool accomplishment. It really Thank is. Thank you. Yeah. So can you, for our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with EMDR, can you give them a kind of brief overview of it? Yes. Yeah. So um, let's see. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the therapists would do that and your eyes would move. But it doesn't have to be eye movement. It could be any bilateral stimulation. Okay. Um, so what that does is it, it's initiating the brain's natural healing ability. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, how it goes is you want to think of a negative belief you have about yourself. I'm not safe or something. And what do you want to believe instead? I am safe or as safe as I can be, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, why don't you feel safe? What memory comes up for you? What emotions? Where do you feel it physically? So then you would Act, basically activate your neural network of I'm not safe because of this car accident or something. Mm -hmm. And you would think on that while the bilateral stimulation is happening. And it basically is taking it out of the emotional brain. I explain it like we have our emotional brain, our human brain, and our primitive and emotional brain. Mm -hmm. And trauma, it's always with us until we process it. Yeah, the way that someone had explained it to me a little bit, and I don't know if this is totally accurate, but they, they talked to me about how it's almost like when when we're dealing with trauma and it's stuck inside of that emotional part of our brain, there's no time that exists in that part of the brain. So it feels brand new. And that's what causes the anxiety. That's what causes those triggers and that, that you know... Um, that feeling of like <gasps> panic and, and fear and um, maybe discouragement or whatever it is. And so by doing this EMDR, it, it takes it and it, it almost puts it in a part of the brain where now all of a sudden you can say this happened past tense. It is not happening. So I don't have to feel fear because it is not happening to me right now. Even if something seems similar, that event was in the past. This is right now and I'm okay. You know, and I, for me, like that connected, it, it was a really nice way of connecting the, the understanding of like how powerful our brains are. And um, it, it honestly, learning more about trauma in the brain and how it all works has given me such a stronger testimony of Heavenly Father and the way that he designed our bodies. It's so smart. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's genius to think it's there to protect us, right? Like we needed it at certain times. It's there to protect us with the influence of the Holy Ghost. But um, we're supposed to learn and to grow, right? Like we're supposed to understand who we are. And I think that a lot of times that includes understanding how we function, how we are designed to function. You know, well, thank you for, for explaining that. I love the logic side. So I, I love the idea of taking something emotional, an emotional response and, mm -hmm. and 
being able to process it logically. Mm -hmm. And that kind of feels like maybe what EMDR yes. can help you do. Well, I have a, a quick question before we before we end. And and this is <laughs> we didn't preface this and I didn't put this in our outline, Lisa. So I'm, you're just it's off the cuff here. But um, one of the things that I really had to had to go through and I think that the hardest part of healing for me was um, how do I show Christ like love to those who hurt me? Um. It was it was a very, very hard lesson because we're told we have to forgive everybody and we need to love everybody. We don't need to agree with them. We don't need to brush away their sin and act like it didn't happen. You know what I mean? Like we can absolutely acknowledge the hurt and the pain, but that's still a really, really heavy, heavy thing for a lot of people to do, whether they've dealt with trauma or not. There are people in this life who I've met personally that I'm like, that person's pure evil, but it's not really my place to judge how evil they are, right? Like it's just my job, my job is I need to still hope for the best for them um, in the sense that the gospel can somehow penetrate their life, that they can use the atonement. They're still going to have to pay for what they've done, right? Like they're, it, they're still going to have that judgment day fall on them. But has there been anything that's helped you to be able to, um, even if you haven't fully gotten to the point of forgiveness yet, has it helped you to kind of let some of that anger go towards the people who hurt you? Um, so, I mean, it's very, it's a very difficult subject, but um, yeah, you're right. Forgiveness is a process and I'm always rethinking it. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Um, and I've tried to be careful with people with that, but I'm becoming more comfortable with that. And um, I do feel for uh, the perpetrators. I always thought growing up, well, better to be me than you, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I don't really want, I, mean, I, I, I try to, I lean on mercy a lot more, I think, but I, but justice, the idea of justice has comforted me greatly because, you know, I deserve, just like everybody deserves a heavenly father, a earthly father to be outraged mm -hmm. at the abuse. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, a friend of mine told me a long time ago was that hurt people hurt people. And um, that's something that kind of plays on a loop in my own mind. Whenever I think about the people who hurt me, I think about um, how much I don't know about their life and their experiences. And I know the struggle that I've personally had trying to get through and to heal and um, to not let those experiences um, dictate how my life was going to go. And so in my prayers, I've had to start, you know, like, it, like at first it says pray for them, right? Well, my prayers were like, oh, I want punishment. You know, I'm going to pray that they get punished. I'm going to pray that they, you know what I mean? That they stub their toe in the middle of the night and, you know, they step on Legos and what, like I, I want them to hurt. Right. And, and so, you know, I would pray for them, but it might, they were not very nice prayers. <laughs> and it wasn't until a while later after, after the retreat, I had had an experience where um, one of the girls was talking about her own abuse. And then, and then she talked about how, sickening it made her feel that um as a child she became the abuser for her younger sibling and even though she knew how it made her feel she wanted to get control back and something clicked with me that day when i heard her her testimony of how much shame she felt for what she did as a child because of what was done to her as a child and instantly i felt like oh my gosh she was hurt so badly and she didn't have the resources to know how to heal. And, she, and we develop habits and our brain holds on to things. And, and there are addictive um, natures that come forward in us where when we don't take the responsibility to heal, we're letting all of that fester and control us. And that's definitely not what Heavenly Father wants for us. And so my prayers have changed to helping uh, to asking Heavenly Father to help those who hurt me to find healing. That's easier for me because I know in my mind that if they can find healing, hopefully it will mean that they will stop spreading that hurt. 
then there won't be other victims, right, that have to go through that whole process mm-hmm. and learn how to survive. And it, it cuts it off at the head, you know. Um, and so if nothing else, I I guess I, I want to encourage listeners, if you've been hurt by someone, you know, in any any degree, if you can't pray for anything really, really good and positive in their life, at least pray for them to heal so that they don't hurt anyone else. Um, I think that that's, there's power in prayer and especially, um, especially when it's the victims praying for the, the abusers, essentially, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of power and a lot of Christ-like power that comes from that. So yeah. It heals us. Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. It does. It it gives us it gives us permission to heal, right? It gives them permission to heal and then and then it gives the the future generations permission to heal as well. Well, Lisa, thank you so much again. Um just I, I'm so impressed with you and the choices that you've made and um the willingness that you had to be able to share your story, not just on our podcast, but to be writing it down, putting it in a book. Um, do you have a name for your book yet? I know you're still, it's still a work in process. Just the rough, the rough draft name is okay. um, memoir of a survivor turned therapist. Well, when you're finished <laughs> with it and it's out, let us know. And we'll definitely make sure that we can share that, you know, on all of our social media for you so that listeners can, can grab a copy. Okay. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I know that that's a difficult topic to, to cover and it takes a lot of courage to not only share it, but to write a book about it and to get on a podcast and and tell people about it on video. So I had to self-regulate. Thank you so much for having the courage. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for having the courage to do it. And hopefully you can, by sharing your light um, and how you've overcome a lot of this, you know, tragedy and uh, difficulty in your life, you can help other people. So thank you so much for doing that. And for those listening, um, if you are struggling with, with abuse in your life, Um, make sure that you check out some of the references we're going to include in this podcast. And if you need help and you don't know where to go, reach out to us and we can help uh, point you in the right direction as well. Um, Lisa, is there any way that they can, um, are there any hotlines that, that sexual abuse survivors can call or websites they can go to and research their own and, and try to find resources in their own area that you know of? Yeah, the main one that I'm thinking of now is Rain R A I N N and Rape okay. and Incest Network. Forgetting all the, the full acronym, but there's 800 numbers. There's all kinds of resources. We will be sure to to add those links, like Scott said. Thank you, everyone, for coming on our podcast today and listening to this wonderful message of how to overcome tragedy and trauma in our lives and if you have a story like lisa and you'd like to share that with other members and other people in the world make sure to go to our website latterdaylights.com and share that and also you know if you want to help us share light into the world make sure that you like and subscribe on social media and help us to get this out there so that we can touch as many lives as possible. Absolutely. You know, with your help, you guys, our hope is that we'll be able to reach, reach out to others and help them to be able to feel that love that the Savior has for them and the joy that comes from living to the gospel, living with the gospel. So until next time, we hope you guys have a great week. We'll see you uh, Sunday. Bye.